the Seattle music scene is overflowing with great bands, artists, and personalities. It is one man's mission to pull them away from their important work to put them on display for your entertainment. That place is the Ultra Nas Podcast. And now, he never has any money, but at least he can't dance. At all. He puts the eat in Seattle, your chubby yet sexually attractive host, Terrence Leroy Jenkins. Now let's start the show. All right. Awesome. Today, we have, I'm going to probably pronounce this wrong, Ivan... De Prume? De Prume. De Prume. Okay. I don't know if the, the E was an A sound. Ivan De Prume. Okay. So you are the original drummer of White Zombie and the current drummer of Big News. And Big News is about to release their new album, The Lowdown, on Valentine's Day. Is that all correct? That's right. Awesome, man. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How about yourself? Good. You sound like you're energetic, man. I've never met you in person, so, you know, I see these pictures of this metal dude with this big metal mustache and stuff, you know? (laughs) I know you're going to be so, like, upbeat. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, I I try to be, you know. I... uh I, I like to approach everything with energy so that uh, I'm prepared for the unexpected, it. I guess, you know? Yeah, no. Uh, so tell us about the band, man. Um, I read some stuff about it. I listened to that song quite a bit. I mean, it's really cool. It reminds me of like early, mid 90s, like very artistic. And then it also gets really heavy and there's some noisy stuff in there. Um you're drumming on that, so it's got a, it's got a cool vibe, man. I, just uh, tell me about how that all came about, how long it's been going on, and and uh, why release a new album. Well, it's band started off with uh, Al Severia and myself. Um, we uh, were working on a different project, and uh, uh, that project wasn't working out too well, so we ended up uh, just started. Uh, uh, jamming. We just started. We just decided to start jamming on uh, some new material, and uh, we're like, we're like, you know what? Let's put a new band together with this uh, material, and we did. And uh, we brought Mike Bell into the project, and um, Robert Keith Chum uh, on bass, and uh, uh, everything. Everything fell together really fast. We uh, we released an EP uh, last year, and. Uh, Began recording our full-length LP uh, last summer, and um, and over the last uh, several months, we were finishing it up, mixing, mastered with uh, Mara Applebaum, who's uh, he, he mastered Faith and More's stuff, and and the stuff the stuff sounds great. Uh, I recorded we, we all the pre-production, everything uh, happened in, out of my recording studio, Burning Sound Studios. You did all the engineering, you did the drum sound, you recorded the vocals, everything. You just you had another guy mix it and probably another person master it. I mixed it actually. Oh, you I did the mixing. It. Okay, so you I just did had the a mixing. mastering engineer go over yeah. it and go over levels and everything. Awesome. Yeah, 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 and uh, yeah, I'm really happy with the the way everything came out. It's pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal uh, project. I'm I'm really happy uh, the way everything came together, and uh, looking forward to these shows. We got a couple of shows coming up here. We're playing in uh, Tacoma, Washington, at the Java Jive, and uh, that's on uh, <clears throat> on Saturday the 15th, and uh, and then Portland, Oregon, at the Twilight on uh, on the 16th. Wow. How long has it been since you played a show? Is it pretty recently, or has this been a while? Uh, uh, no, we, we, we played some shows last year. Uh, we, we've been focusing mainly on recording after the summer, but we were we did a string of dates uh, through the whole Portland-Salem uh, area, um, and uh, and that was fun. That was a lot of fun playing out. Uh and uh, yeah, so I'm excited to play out again. It's been, it has been a few months. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I stopped, uh, well... The, my last band, Odyssean, ended. Um, there was some stuff there, whatever. But then I started this new project, and I haven't played a show since last summer, I want to say. And I'm like, as the time gets between the last show I played and the one I'm going to play <laughs> whenever I book that, uh, it's just, I was in such a groove. I must have been playing a show like every week or something at some point, or, you know, even more than that sometimes. And, it was just like second nature. Now I'm like, geez, I don't know what's gonna happen when I get back up on stage, man. I oh man, I know, I know how, I know how that feels, you know. Especially playing drums, we gotta have the. You do, what do you play? What instrument? I play. Uh, my main instrument is drums. In this new project, I'm doing vocals and guitar. Um, 
not because I felt like I was, you know, I'm not like like the cliche person who felt like I was like not getting enough pictures. I just I uh, nobody else was going to take the role of vocals, I guess. And I can't drum and do vocals. So then I was like, OK, I can play guitar and sing. So I'll just do that. So I got a really awesome drummer. And so now I'm not worried about that at all, but now I got to be in the front and I haven't done that ever. So ever. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be a whole other animal. I play guitar once and I got like really bad cod mouth and like got really <laughs> like nervous. And I was like, oh my wow. God, I want to go play the drums again. So I, I've, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've never been in the front of the stage, man. I've always been behind the kit. And, uh, so it's going to be a new experience for me, but yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. It's, Put the time between your last show and the next one is always that uh, the first song, you know, like, yeah, cool and everything's going good, you know, but that's not always how it happens. <laughs> so I hear you, man. Yeah. Yeah. Getting up on stage, uh, whether you're behind the kid or, or in front of the stage, it's such a such a, an, an exciting experience. And um, uh, preparation is everything, you know, as long as you guys, yeah. uh, you know, do your rehearsals and uh and uh, get your get all the little details out of the way beforehand. Then when you're on stage, everything should flow smoothly, I think. And <laughs> we'll see. No. Uh, so I'm interested. Tell us about your studio. We you record all this stuff. Is this out of your house? Is it? I have a uh, it's a five bedroom house uh, uh, in um, on the Salem area. It's uh, actually just outside in the rural between Silverton and Salem. And uh it's like a little farmhouse, uh, well, a big farmhouse, I guess, with five bedroom house, and, and, but it's on a one acre, and, and so uh, you know we got uh, uh, a, a nice big basement down here. And originally, I was gonna convert this big uh, RV garage, but uh, when I looked into how, what that's gonna entail, I decided let me stick with the house because it's nice being in the same structure because you don't have to go outside in the room, especially here in uh, this rainy uh, part of the planet, I guess you could say. Yeah, you guys <laughs> or, are like pretty much the same as us being so close to the water. You're, you're warmer, but it's a lot of rain. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, uh, it's a nice big, uh, basement and, uh, I, uh, renovated the whole thing to have, uh, uh, isolated, uh, rooms. So you have, uh, your big live room, control room, ISO booth, which is vocal booth. And, uh, and so I, uh, I used to host uh, a radio show on KUFO called Metalopolis back in the, in the days. And, uh, when they, when they were under CBS radio and when they were bought out by Alpha Broadcasting, they tore down a bunch of stations. At the same time, I was building this basement and there was a, tons of materials from these, these ISO, uh, rooms where they were recording. Like acoustic that panels and stuff? I took all the sound panels, the huge windows between, you know, these double glass pane windows, doors with these ice isolation freaking uh, uh, plates that drop down and close off the sound, and even including uh, uh, just tons of tons of gear materials. Um, I scored big time. I was like, my budget was so limited at the time that I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off build my studio, you know? And I was mentioning to the guys on the, at the radio station and they were like, one day they called me and was like, Ivan, rent a freaking U-Haul and come down. We're tearing down this building. I'm like, are you kidding me? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and I, I even got these rolls of 25 channel mic, um, uh, you know, pairs uh, uh, for, for just tons of cables. I mean, the the the, the copper in that alone could sell. <laughs> what kind of a, did they have like a board there and stuff? Or? Oh, yeah. Tons of mixing boards. And one of these boards had like tons of channels. I forget how, how big it was. Probably like a uh, hundred channels of, and, and each of these channels had um, these great um, uh, converters. I think the J Seng converters or something like that. And I, I couldn't rebuild the board to work as for my preamps, but I had a guy who made it cut a deal with me because um, I posted it to sell it. And he was like, well, I don't have the cash, but I could trade it out for a Neve 1073. I'm like, Oh, Oh, yeah. Wow. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in my studio, I have Avalon, a dual Avalon uh, uh, preamps. I have the Neve 1073, which is actually a clone, not the original. And, um, and I have really awesome preamps. That's an eight channel Phoenix audio. That's the DRS eight, 
which is phenomenal. My front end uh, to the studio is the RME Fireface, which is the UFX. And that I loved using the Total Mix, um, uh, you know, software to control all this because it, it's literally like having your hands on a mixer board. Uh, which has amazing routing options. I'm sure you know about the total mix of facts. Uh, yeah, and- totally, man. I mean, it's the technology, the way it's integrated into everything at this point. It's like, I don't even know if we could go back. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I mean, I, God, if we had to go back to those days, I mean, oh, I think uh, it'll be a collapse of uh, civilization. <laughs> stuff. Yeah, there was, there was such great recordings made before all this stuff. But it's like, I, I just, you know... It's cut down on personnel, for one, which, you know, is a good thing and a bad thing. If you want to record music, you don't have to go to a big-ass studio. But then the need for an engineer isn't as bad. So, I mean, now there's, like, a lot of really mediocre engineers out there. And it's hard for those businesses and people to see, especially people who are laymen. And when I say that, I mean, like musicians you know like at once you and i did not record things and we were just like whatever you know let's go to the nicest studio or whatever and uh, we we heard from someone else and that's how things worked but now everyone records and everyone tells you that they're the best and unless you really know you know you could give someone a bunch of money and get all the way to the end of this recording it could be a hellhole trying to get it you know and uh, i mean mainly I think the the thing I try to do the most as an engineer at this point is just make sure I'm I'm not getting in the way of creativity. I think that a lot of people think because they watched a video on Bob Rock or something that they have to be in there giving their fucking opinion about everything, but I mean a lot of people that if you're going to work with them, you should check them out first if they're already good if they ask you for your opinion. Well then sure, but if if not, you know, just be there. Be ready. Give them positive reinforcement, you know. Make sure that you're – but, yeah, so, yeah, the technology part of it, man, it's – you can – you I can run a whole studio with – just myself just about you know it's crazy <laughs> yeah yeah and that and you're absolutely right getting the, when even though everything is so easy and and quick um it, if you if you're not really experienced with the stuff the the uh, you're 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 wearing different hats at the same time so you're it, it could get in the way of creativity if you're having technical problems and you know it, it's there's nothing like just being able to focus on just the song like playing the song and the vibe of the song and being the actual musician and not have to be the engineer and make sure the mic is in the right place or make sure that your your gain is not too high or or uh, using the right right uh, software stuff or you know it, it can just get so crazy because there's so many different steps in the process especially with like drums i think uh you know since we're both drummers i guess you know i learned how to record that first because it was really important to me as a drummer that you know my drums sound good absolutely and there's this there's a lot of science there that people don't really understand you know and uh so we i get uh, a lot of people if anybody comes to me for anything they mainly come to me for drums and cuz they can record their guitar at the house a lot of people can and uh they can record their vocals in their bedroom if they deaden up a, a closet or something. But drums is the last thing left to where, like, you have to have a lot of experience with it to to make sure it sounds like the way it should sound. <laughs> like, it, to make something sound like a drum set in a room when it's on a recording is not just as simple as putting the microphones up and stuff. You got to design the room and design it around their song and, you know, their their feel. And, and you know, it's, it's really, there's a whole lot going on there that, like you said, you're wearing all those goddamn hats. I've done it and played the drums many times, but it's never as good as when I have someone else do it for me. So we still are needed. I know that we're, we're still needed by people. I'm, I'm doing a session for a city of industry, on the 15th at uh, Uber Beats in Linwood. It's a really, really cool studio here. Oh, cool. They're a, they're a three-piece. They're all going to play together, old school style. They're going to play at the same time. They're going to track it all together, and they're going to keep those takes. So that's how we did with them last time. And I was just like, wow, how great it sounded. And the energy of that recording was amazing compared to nice when you, you get the scratch track and then 
you edit the scratch track to the click and then the drummer comes in and he records over that scratch track and then yada 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 it's just this like process and they did it in like a day they recorded it like a whole like it was only 17 minutes of music but they recorded their whole thing one day i mean there still was some editing to do after that you know, but i was just like wow man it, it's uh, i mean what's your take on that do you still have anybody come in and uh, does like everyone records at the same time or do you mainly absolutely just... no I, that's the way I, 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 when yeah yeah when a, when a, when it's a band uh, I, I look at, I look at, uh, they, they need to play together because if they're, if they're separated, they're not going to have the same, the same vibe, but I have them play together, but not necessarily everything's going to be, uh, uh, used. You know, the, the main thing I look for is getting a great drum take to start off the foundation of the songs and, and everybody, but you know, the drummer has to play with the, that way the drummer can like see the, the guitar player or, you know, that they, they're vibing together and then the energy is there. And then, um, if then I listen back and if the drums are great, fantastic, I listen to the bass and the, and the bass might be like, you know, you need, you need some replace this or that. And then we just, you know, do overdubs or re-record the bass. And then, then I go, I work my way up the frequencies to the guitars and then the overdubs of the guitars and then vocals last typically the source sound is going to be like a lot of the way it ends up sounding you know it's there's no magic button or magic knob or you know even now with computers if it's a bad vocal take it's a bad vocal take i mean there's a lot you can do to it but it's going to end up sounding so unnatural (laughs) yeah yeah and I, i would say the 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 main thing is uh is you know, try to try to get the best preamp and microphones you can get, <clears throat> because um, uh, that's that's where it starts. Of course, of course, you gotta have great drum heads. <laughs> you know, once your instrument, you gotta start with you first as a human being. Are you ready to record? <laughs> you know, uh, hitting the drums. Uh, get make sure when you're playing that each hit on the snare maybe it will match the last hit like you know to 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 not get weak and die off in the middle of the song get fall off the click i recommend recording with the click because then your timing is perfect and then you can chop the pieces around if you if you you know want it if you like the second chorus what you did a drum fill and you were supposed to do that on the first chorus you don't have to re-record it you can move it over you'll be in the grid and if you can't play to a click yet then just get your natural vibe and and just just keep the intensity there through the process of the of the recording um and uh and then and then and then of course the microphones of the drums should be i like having the microphones uh directly uh, maybe an inch away from each drum. So it, close miking system, I think, is is my favorite. And then having an overhead, uh, you know, left and right over the cymbals and a room mic would be What's ideal. What's your favorite overhead technique? If I'm uh, I, the X Y, uh, I like. Um, uh, you know, and and I've played with different different ways, and and I I, I think. Um, uh, Move the mics and, and so you can really hear the cymbals. You know, it, it depends on what you're going for. If the overhead is is you want to get the whole kit, or is the overheads really to pick up your your cymbals mainly, and you have close mics for all the drums. Um, and be careful with your room mic. I uh, I found that the the room mic can muddy up the whole mix. It's kind of funny how the room mic of the drums can can get the whole mix to sound washed out a little bit like if you t- can, remove that one of those drums being muddy can also make the whole drum mix sound bad so yeah yeah the direct the direct miking is gets the your the drums are right in your face you know and you get the more intensity and then don't let the 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 meters get anywhere near the red I go for uh, between 12 and 5 decibels below so you have extra headroom so when you're doing your gain staging, you're, you're you get way better resolution out of your DAW too if you stay within those parameters. Absolutely, that's the that's the ticket. I think you know. Uh, you don't notice the whole that until you try to get it really loud, but yeah, <laughs> you want it to be loud in the end and in your face. You don't want it to be crackling or there to be some undesirable overtone in there. Yeah, so. 
But ultimately, ultimately, you're going to capture what you record. That is, you're not going to get, you can, you can only make a, a, a turd sound so good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just like, the, that leads me to my next thing. You've been drumming for how many years now, would you say? Oh, man, uh, pr- <laughs> probably about 37 years. I, I, I've been drumming since I was 12. I'm 52. Um, but I, I've been banging on desks in school since I was uh, uh, seven years older, as long as I can remember. Let me put it that way. I got kicked out of class so many times uh, after I heard, out of Moby Dick, I heard that song. <laughs> the song remains the same. My Aunt Carol showed me that. And uh, I couldn't stop there's one part in there where he was playing like some bongos and stuff and he's going back and forth between these like different drums and I I couldn't get it out of my head and I remember tapping on the drum on the desk and stuff and my teacher would just be like dude stop you know I just couldn't and uh I used to t- tap on everything and I remember when I first got my first like playable drum set um oh. I mean I was so stoked and I then it was my mom who was like dude please stop no but uh when was it cuz this uh let's see we'll do a little wikipedia fact or fiction but uh this is what I got you were born in Brooklyn Yep is that that correct how long I was did born you in stay Brooklyn there? I was, in, I was in Brooklyn until uh, uh, 90 or 91 when... Uh, okay, well, uh, when White- yeah, you spent your formidable years there. So you must have learned how to play drums in the environment of an apartment, I'm assuming, or... No, no, no. Uh, I, 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 uh, I got my first drum kit. Uh, I was doing working a summer camp when I was... Uh, about 13 years old or 12 years old or something like that. Um, and uh, I was uh, working at summer camp, you know, for for kids in the neighborhood um, in Brooklyn. And uh, I, um, I I needed to, I, I didn't know what I exactly, I, this guy who lived up in my house ended up turning me on to buying used musical equipment and, and stuff on the, on the, in the newspaper. And I ended up picking up a drum kit and, uh, and, um, and then uh, I joined White Zombie after uh, after playing with a few other bands in the neighborhood, and uh, we wrote the album. We wrote the album uh, that hit that freaking went multi platinum in that basement of my mother's house uh, before uh, we ended up getting signed and moving to. Um, uh, California, and um, but there was f- about four other albums before that big album that hit that we also re- did in my. No, we didn't record the album in my basement. I'm sorry. The album was was written in my basement. I don't know if I said I recorded. I, I'm recording. I don't know. Now, but- <laughs> no, I'm, I, that's good to clear I, up. Yeah, but this is like <laughs> late '80s, mid '80s. Yeah, yeah. I did not have back then. I, if I would have recorded that album, I would have freaking that would have been phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Saying if you were able to do that, yeah. No, so the, <laughs> that was recorded at the here. Record Plant Three Two One Studios uh, in uh, the old Record Plant in Manhattan uh, with Andy Wallace uh, producing it. And uh, oh wow. Yeah, that was that was a, a phenomenal experience. I got to tell you, uh, a big name, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. And uh, you know, we 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 toured the United States several times, and we toured Europe, and then went back toward the United States again, Canada, um, and uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, I left the band in '92, and uh, and then got into uh, recording after that. Before that, I, I I was not uh, doing recording audio. I was more interested in uh, being, becoming a, 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 a other than of course the be, being a drummer. I wanted to be a filmmaker. Oh, really? I, I was interested in becoming a director, uh, uh, doing movies and stuff. And I've done a little bit of that, dibbled and dabbled. Uh, my my sister's an actress, uh, and uh, kind of teamed up with her on some projects uh, uh, back in the day throughout my career. Yeah, so would you say that after being in White Zombie, I mean, you obviously toured quite a bit and you did that whole rigmarole. I mean, a lot of people that end up going into the recording side of things from being a musician, they kind of find that their role as the engineer is just a little bit more suitable. And in your case, also probably the director, which is kind of a lot, in the, it follows the same lines as the engineer or the producer. Absolutely. Um, 
the the touring life really isn't for everybody. It's some people are just built yeah. for it, but other yeah. people it's just it wears it, it on you. It know? conflicts with family life. It it, it does conflict with uh, you know if you tour a lot. There, the family life is the road with the people you're on the road with, and uh, you, you have to kind of uh, carefully manage um, damage control of what you do with your significant others at home, because being away and distance uh, is not uh, the most healthy thing for relationships. And so, um, yes, yes, that is something you have to face. And, uh, yeah, it's not for everybody. It's, uh, it could be, it could be a cruel world out there with, uh, you know, and especially if, if you don't have the right project, if your project is not, uh, if you don't freaking love your music, don't do it. You know what I mean? That's, and, or if you're not, if you're making, you're making a ton of money and you hate it, then, you know, got to love the money. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be some. There's got to be some motivation. Got to be some motivation. Of course, of course. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, the money is not the biggest thing in the music business. So, well, and you know, what's funny is I've heard it said before, and, and I agree with it. If you're single, um, there's freedom and poverty. There really is. And I mean that in a way like you don't have to be rich to be happy. Sometimes not having a shitload of responsibilities and just kind of every day waking up uh, with, you know, the clothes you have and, and whatever, oh, yeah. a few bucks in your pocket and be like, what am I going to spend my day doing has some real like value to it. Absolutely. However, yeah, totally. You know, in, in, uh, but at the same time, a lot of people who aren't like overly motivated, that kind of freedom, if you will, can be detrimental to them, you know, and bring them down some dark places. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I will. I, I'm always working. I do the podcast. I run my little studio. I'm always networking with people. I'm always working on stuff. I'm always making videos. I never stop. I'm always writing music. That's cool. You know, right before I did this podcast, I tracked a bunch of vocals with my vocalist. And nice. Working on it. I got video, you know, photo shoots and video shoots and stuff lined up. I just... I'm always setting stuff up in the future. And I know that, that, you know, I'm following the model and not not on purpose, but I find out later on it's like that's pretty common for people like us, you know, for people who are in the music industry or aspire to do stuff like that. It's you kind of have to be that way or else you're just going to get overwhelmed if you, you don't enjoy kind of always having something to do and you want to sit down and watch TV for 12 hours. Yeah. And this is not, this is not the gig for you. Um, right. You know, cause there's not going to be a bunch of time to sit around watching TV programs and stuff. I mean, but I don't even, I don't really watch TV all that much. And, uh, unless it's something really cool or artistic, you know, then I'll spend some time absorbing it. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I get really caught up in, in uh, when I talk to people who are musicians who have had a lot of touring experience and, and stuff like that and have probably stopped. It's, it's interesting, you know, everyone has their own take on that. Uh, since leaving that and kind of, you know, for a lot of years now, not being like on a crazy tour all the time, you feel like your life has improved a lot or do you still miss it? Um, my life has improved in other ways. Uh, it's... it's uh I mean, it's been it's been uh, 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 quite a few years since I've done the vigorous touring experience. Uh, uh, so so you know, I, I I just take what I have in front of me and I make and I try to make the best of it. And um, and so it's been it's been mainly uh, project various projects that I um, mainly musical projects, different bands that uh, uh, like one of the biggest groups I've uh, I've, I've put together uh, other than White Zombie was a band called Healer. And we started that off in Los Angeles. And that band uh, was was like a Middle Eastern meets heavy metal sound uh, with a violinist from Cirque du Soleil, Martin St. Pierre. And, uh, and it had a, a, an incredible sound. Uh, but the industry just, you know, at the time didn't know how to market it. And uh, we pushed really hard to try to make things happen. Happen and it just never hit. Uh, and then the musicians and the band ended up moving on to other projects. And that's when I left uh, the LA and moved up to uh, Oregon. And um, 
So there's a lot of, so that's why you have to love it. You know, if you, if you, if you love it, you keep going. If you, um, uh, uh, so, so, with, so, with, so then of course I, I, uh, ended up meeting a woman who I ended up marrying and having children and did the family life at the same time that band kind of fell apart. So I kind of shifted, uh, coming, you know, going from, uh, trying to hit it, hit it again, big in the LA scene, moving over to more of doing, doing recording. Uh, I, I was doing a lot of virtual drumming. So I was drumming for different projects and for different bands around the world over the internet, sending them the, the drum track stems and they would in, load it into their sessions. And, you know, we were, you know, we're talking about back in like 2003 when that first started off. And, um, and I realized I don't have to really be in LA to do that. And that's where I was, you know, wanted to focus more on, on that thing. And then I, so that's when I moved up here and built the studio and focused more on, on that kind of, uh, uh, path, which then led to, uh, just, just desperately wanting to have my own band again and put together another few projects that, uh, joined some projects, a couple of projects, put together a couple of projects and landed right here with big news. <laughs> nice. That sounds like you're doing just fine to me, man. You know, and it's it's all it's all relative. It's like it's like like you said. You know, you can have the you can feel like you're you're extremely wealthy. It's all about value. What is your value? Is it monetary value? Is it how freaking how many days you played on tour? What's your, the where do we find our value? And 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 um, uh, it's like you said. You, you know, you can have just one guitar and a backpack and be free to roam. And, and that is the biggest freedom. And you can feel like your life is fantastic because you can create so much with just one instrument and a little tape recorder and you can write the biggest album in the world, you know, <laughs> one little, one little recorder. And then all you have to do is put a band together and then, you know, it's, 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 it's what makes you happy is what counts. It's 100% perception. Yeah. I mean, and I've always, I've always known that, and I haven't always listened to my own words. <laughs> Sometimes we get a little stray, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's one hundred percent perception. It's how you view things, yeah. And 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 you know, like you said, what is important to you? Your sanity. You know, I mean, some people hate being ripped around and asked questions. Oh God, I know. Doing stuff and asked for their time, they feel like you know it's way too much. And me, I love being a part of people's creations. I love it. It's my favorite thing. And I, one of my favorite feelings on earth is when we get done with something and someone goes, man, Terry, this thing sounds so great. Thank you for helping me or the other way around. And, you know, we get to enjoy that together. And like, this is something about that, that it never gets old to me. Yeah. No matter what. I know while we're doing it too, there's, it's so fun to finally get the mics in the same, the right place. And with nothing on them, you're just like, God, these drums sound great. And you get that great feeling. And then you start working on other stuff. It's just, there's something to it. I can't explain to other people, but it gives me like great joy to work on stuff like that. And, uh, I love it so much. And I, I'm so glad that, you know, I've gotten a chance to work on people's stuff and hopefully I continue to, you know, as long as I can hear and I try to protect my hearing the best I can, but you know how it goes, being a drummer. But uh, no, but so I guess that's another thing. After all this time looking back, are you still extremely proud of what you did with White Zombie? Uh, absolutely. Or is it absolutely. It's, 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 it, there's, nothing, there's nothing in the world that can, it can describe that you know, feeling when you just like generation after generation since that album's been released, uh, there's like these movements of of kids that that discover that record and are just completely blown away by it. And it just moves me to to experience um, like I get I get fan mail that uh, people just are like. Holy shit! That album's the greatest album in the world, you know. And and the you know describing my drums and explaining to me oh, what straight up. I haven't even gotten to that point yet, but we will get to that, man. That is, <laughs> go ahead, keep yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. And and so to me, that that's like that's like uh, I'm like, wow. I again have impacted someone's life to such a degree. What? 
You know, to me, that's that's huge because to, the fact that I did something that impacted someone's life when they describe how 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 they listened to that record in the in the darkest times of their life and it and it helped them get through these times when they were younger and then they're still listening to it and it's still uh, and then they're like I'm still playing it three times a week. I'm like, wow, that is wow. Something I did like I really. <laughs> so so yeah that's that's yeah. so I have to be proud of it and I, that's that gives me gives me a feeling of sa- some deep satisfaction um you know I uh I I definitely don't agree with the way uh Rob Zombie ended the whole uh project uh you know the way he, he did some backstabbing things uh to uh, different members in the band and I shouldn't go into detail so there's no lawsuit but um uh, you don't have to but you know i mean there has always been rumors i mean we don't know because i wasn't there i'm not rob zombie's friend um but obviously i've never even met him before i've i've seen him live um as rob zombie i never got to see white zombie live ever um i always wanted to it was always kind of a tease to see Rob Zombie and he would play a couple of songs off of Los Exorcisto and it would just be like, ah, it's just not the same. You know I mean? Cause you see the old videos <laughs> cause people somehow get these videos. And I always wonder like, damn, where did this video uh-huh. come from? But there's a video of way back in the day when it's like the heyday of uh-huh. that album. And it's just, you can feel and see the energy in that video. And I'm not saying that, you know, any musicians he's played with currently or anything aren't great musicians or anything like that. It's just, it doesn't have the same vibe. And, you know, he's he's given the fans what they want, obviously, you know, so, but again, yeah, I mean, I don't know how it all ended. Yeah, and, and I think, it, you know, a, a huge part of it is, 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 uh, you know, behind the drums, like, like what, what is, what is the, it, it's all about it's all about the drive, and I played the drums with my whole life, and the, the, I knew, uh, like I wrote those songs with the band members, and and my energy came from you know the certain certain flavors of uh, my background that in, influenced that energy, um, you know, talking like Slayer, Beastie Boys, um, uh, you know, d- just hardcore energy, like. Like a biohazard and and like like the these 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 elements um, uh, help write those songs and and uh, and those grooves were written from that flavor. So so we, the you know we 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 had a certain drive back then that just got washed away when he just replaced everybody because these new members now have to perform. To um, to what Rob Zombie wants at the time, and he he kind of steered away from that, and that's one of the reasons why I just did not respect him anymore. Um, uh, right away, he he, he like. I, I don't want to. I don't want to get too far into that. But but he, you know, there was just there was just a a, a, a big change in the direction. It became more square, uh, mechanical. The ministry flavor, uh, you know, and and um, definitely you can tell in that 1995 release, uh, Astro Creep, that uh, it's it's. I like a couple of songs off that for sure. It was it, well, 95. I would have been just turning 11 years old. I was very absorbing everything around me and uh that shit was on the radio you said andy wallace was the producer on that right yeah yeah andy wallace also did so many great albums i mean the list is insane and it's got i I was i was gonna bring that up it's it's funny this is the second interview in a row that like you guys must read my mind or something or i don't but no that's my my next thing was gonna be like the drum sound on that album it's got the Andy Wallace sound. It's got, it does, it, the the snare being so up in front and the bass drum being so, like, it's so, the way it's mic'd and the way it was engineered, um, it's so fucking heavy, dude. Like, uh, Thunder Kiss, for instance, like, it starts off with that fucking, uh, the guitar riff. 
Dude, we used to play that song every day. Nice. Like every day, I could put that song on repeat when oh. I was a kid. And dude, just headbang. Love that song so much. Um, and I love that whole album. But it was like, I remember that drum beat and trying to play that fucking drum beat, the... the and I couldn't get the, the foot pattern. Took me so long to get that solid. But I would always just be like, damn, that fucking drummer is insane. But uh, that's what I'm talking about, man. Is like, that's, you can tell that there's this insane difference between that album and the album that comes right <laughs> after that. It's almost like, well, I don't know if there was even real drums on it. I mean, sure. <laughs> but. I'm sure there was, but they're very heavily, heavily sampled. Yeah. Like you said, like a ministry feel. There's definitely a, a like fake drums in there to make it sound very machine like. Um, even one of the songs on the beginning of Astro Creep, it starts off with what sounds like a machine. And then <laughs> that's the drum beat for the rest of the yeah, song. Yeah. But then the album right before it, like you were on, it was more of like this. I don't even know how to put it, but like psychedelic heavy yeah. metal super driving kind of thing um yeah it's it's so crazy talking to you about <laughs> yeah I mean, you're, you're the drummer in there and that that, that is obvious honestly the biggest difference between those two albums is the percussion yeah, it, it has a tribal there's a there's a, a little element of of uh of, of just organic tribal uh energy that uh that i brought to the table that uh uh, is very, you know, and I, and, and I, that's why I feel like, you know, it's my, it's my, it's, it, it has a lot to do with how I was raised. It, it like, that's the freaking, I don't know. I don't know how to put it. It's like my voice, uh, from, from my, from th through, through all the years of, uh, growing up in Brooklyn, uh, just releasing. It was my, my big release. And, uh, we recorded this, these drums in this gigantic concrete room, uh, three to one studios. Um, really? uh, there, yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, the old rec, the old record plant. It's the old record plant in Manhattan. I remember, uh, going down there, taking the subway to record the album up there. We rented the drums from, uh, from uh, SIR Rentals, and uh, it was a Pearl All Maple Custom Drum Kit. Uh, I still have my. You remember what kind of snare it was? I want to say it was a brass Pearl free floating. Want to say it was that? It's I. Uh, how, how many? How many days or how many takes or whatever? How I many? How long did it take to get drum tracks that you and in the band and the producer were satisfied? With? It took uh, probably a week or so. Uh, I, I, uh, th there's a couple of spots I had to punch in. Uh, some songs just was real easy. Bam. I can go right through it. Some of them I, uh, you know, cause I, all of this was played to a click. Uh, and I, and I worked with a click in pre-production and writing the songs. And that was one of the big changes that occurred from when, and I don't even know why I chose to start working with a drum click. Um, but, but when we were, when we started writing these songs, I, uh, I, I, I picked up a, an, uh, one of those Roland SR 16 drum machines and I, um, to write these beats, you know, some of the beats when we would go to, uh, when I, we would write, sometimes we would write in, um, Shauna and Rob's apartment. You know, they were dating and uh, from the early days and uh, we would go to their apartment because, you know, we, we, we would just be like low key. And uh, and I would on, on the drum machine, I would play some beats, you know, that, that's I think that's how uh, Black Sunshine was written. I was just doing this beat and then Shauna would just start at a bass line. I actually have the the original tapes from <laughs> that rec that rehearsal. And um and it was like, I'm like, oh, that's not four four. <laughs> and and uh, and then and then um, uh, and then I would bring uh, and then we would bring that into my studio where we would get on the live kit, and uh, and I and I realized that that you know we're 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 changing here. Our older music, we would create different tempo changes that were not as uh, appealing you know what I mean like like certain sections would slow down or certain sections and I was like wait a minute 
you know, we don't want to slow that part down. We want to keep it going, keep the drive, keep it going the, through the whole song, you know, like a dance beat. And that shifted right. our approach. You know, like, like we were we went from one of those metal bands that had um, uh, so much more uh, loose timing kind of feels and changes where here's a drama, here's a click. Now I ha- I'm forced to play and keep the tempo through the whole song. And um, I had to actually program the click for some of these songs because we would actually say we have to change timing here. Um, and one of the cha- most challenging click tracks was the beginning of I Am Legend because that song starts off really slow and then it starts to build up you know uh dude those riffs in that fucking album are yeah yeah uh and then i i remember bringing the drum machine to uh the recording of the album and i gave it to them i'm like okay here's all my templates for the songs did you play to a click live then? No, no. And, uh, oh, so when you went to go play live, you just didn't yeah, use Yeah, yeah. We, we dropped the click for the live shows, and we had a, someone just running the samples, uh, um, actually the sound. Oh, yeah, because I was going to ask that. So you didn't have like a tape plan in the background that you had to follow. No. You had we, someone cueing our, our Our driver slash uh, uh, tour manager slash sound man slash sampling guy uh, triggered the samples behind the board. <laughs> Thank you for him. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and then we, and then I had a couple of childhood friends that were, uh, well, actually, just one uh, who, who, this guy Greg Skork, a awesome uh, friend of mine from back in the early days. He um, always went on the road with us uh, up until I left the band. Um, he, uh, uh, yeah, he was one of the loaders of the gear and stuff like that, and. Uh, um, we had another guy who was my drum tech and we had another guy who was guitar tech. And then we had Ted Kedick, who was our tour manager. And, um, yeah, yeah. He would, he would trigger the samples, uh, behind the, the mixing board for the, for the shows. Yeah. Good stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's so amazing, man. I- I don't even know, you know, what, what the, the musical soundscape of that time was. It's really strange. I mean, I don't want to keep talking about it forever, but, you know, how, how White Zombie fit into the scheme of rock music in 1990, 1992, and in, in all those, it, you know, because grunge had just exploded. Yeah. And there was this whole other thing going on. And then there was a few bands kind of still that had their own thing going on. And white zombie was definitely one of those bands that had their own sound. It was not grunge. It was, it's, you know, it, it wasn't like, you know, death metal and it wasn't, you know, Metallica. It was like its own thing. It was heavy. It was groovy. Like you said, very driving, very drum, drum, drum driven stuff. And, you know, Rob's vocals on that stuff was really like nothing else anybody else was doing. Plus the influence of what was like horror movie kind of stuff. It's just, there was a lot going on there. And also, I mean, even before I heard the album, I remember um, just flipping through the pages of the, the CD cover and just being like, what the fuck, man? I was like so much cool shit in there. But uh, yeah, that just incredible album. Glad that we talked to you about that. I always had those questions about that, man. It's so crazy. Thank you, thank you. And and you know, you know, the, the, we had no idea we were going to be big. We we thought we sucked, you know, because we we were we were not like we were not like other bands at the time, you know. We and but. For Les Exorcisto, that album, yeah, I finally felt like we had something special. But leading up to there, I was desperately wanting to be more metal. And we were just a lot of noisy stuff. We had a lot of, you know, we had our own drive. I don't know if you ever heard this, the earlier previous releases, but there there were definitely different personality in, in all of those albums and songs. And um, But we always stuck to our guns because we were like, you know, you know, fuck what they think. You know, we we we're gonna we're gonna stick to our guns here and keep pushing forward because we believe in ourselves. And um, so when I say, you know, I thought we sucked because I I you know we were not like everybody else. Yeah, but look how that ended up working out. And I didn't want to be like anybody. I don't. I didn't want to f- 
I wanted to fit in. I wanted to fit in, but I didn't want to be like, you know what I mean? Like I, you know, it, it's, uh, there's not enough of that now. There's just not enough of that now. I, yeah. I, I was on the cusp of when that all changed, but nowadays people are extremely afraid of sounding different than each other because they're afraid that it won't be accepted True. to the point where they all use each other's drum samples, uh, they all use each other's guitar yeah. sounds and <laughs> fucking everyone's auto-tuned. They don't realize that sometimes being different is extremely important because it sets you apart. It's so true. And you know, it's funny too. That is so true. Music goes in waves. You know, every like That's right. 10 years or so, like if, if you just stick your heels in the sand, you probably will end up riding a wave That's somehow. True. Yeah. I've mean, heard it a thousand times, but if you just keep doing what yeah. you're doing, someone's going to hear it that wants to is like, you know, we'll, we'll support you. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's the it, that those that I think around 2000 around that time, the year 2000, it really took a dive down in individuality. It used to be a time when you turn the radio and from the first fucking guitar riff, you could tell yeah. who it was just because yeah, yeah. it sounded nowadays. You know, I, I used to think it was because I was getting older, but I don't know. Um, I don't know. It, it's it's tough to sound different, you know, when when uh, what kids want to listen to is. They want the same thing. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, yeah. You know, it, everyone could take a lesson from that for sure. So I just had a couple more questions. Okay. Um, so we got bonus questions. I always ask craziest tour story and you can make it shorter as long as you want, but you went on tour with a lot of great bands. What's a crazy tour story that you end up telling at the family? Oh reunion? man. <laughs> I, I, I have a few of them. Uh, one of them, one of them, we were uh, doing a U.S. tour and we had a show in Vegas and we pulled in and we met with the guy. He, he was like, OK, follow us. He took us out into the middle of the desert and there was this big freaking party bonfire and there was um, this big drainage ditch. It's like, okay, the stage is down there. Keep going. And we just go down into this deep freaking concrete uh, uh, bowl that that is for, you know, how fl it floods out there when it rains um, uh, in the desert, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, when they have flash flooding. So they have to control the water into this big bowl. And there's a huge ass pipe in the back of it and these metal uh, metal rods that reach up and over the bowl to uh, contain trash and stuff, but it's just massive. And and um, there were people uh, climbing up on top of those bars, hanging down over the stage where we were playing, and and it was nothing. There was people just just riding motorcycles, shooting guns. And uh, I had to set my kid up. Craziness. Uh, my, the back of my drum kit was at the mouth of the pipe, the like six foot tall, massive pipe uh, for the for the to allow the water to come to drain out. And so um, I, I, you know, for sound check, I decided to put my kit inside the pipe just to feel it out. And I, I, I was like. <gasps> Hit the snare. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it was so massive sounding. But um, that was a, quite an experience, I got to tell you. Another uh, really cool experience was during our European tour. Uh, we played Berlin in 1980. I think it was 88 or 89 when the Berlin Wall just was taken down, which is a a big mark in history, you know, uh, separating East. That is a humongous. Yeah. That's a huge. And, uh, and so we pulled over at the wall and we were like watching people like rushing back and forth, you know, giving each other hugs. Saying, oh, my family, I haven't seen you forever. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I grabbed a piece of the wall and I was like, Oh man, I'm going to keep this. It totally disintegrated. And someone told me to get rid of it. Cause it's, it's got asbestos in it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, that was that was quite quite awesome. And and just just being on on a tour in 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 Europe at the time was was really amazing to to hit some of these uh, 
uh, I love Europe, uh, just the, the, the history in some of these cities and, and traveling between cities was amazing because like you go from one or what countries like each like one country to another is like going from one state to another state here because is everything is so concentrated and and it was just, uh, uh, you, you know, like as we're driving, uh, we're like going from these villages to, to, through a, a heavy city to a, a mountains to tunnels and then another village and yeah so that that was quite quite a uh, an experience there um yeah yeah another another experience was was pantera uh, i i uh backstage pantera show uh, you know i was gonna ask that but i didn't know i was gonna let you bring it up if you were gonna bring it did you tour with i didn't tour with that any big tour I, I we played a couple of shows and that was pretty much it we we played a bunch of shows so you hung out yeah, dime yeah, yeah but I, I i left before the big the big pantera tour but i i uh, i gotta tell you man uh meeting dimebag daryl and hanging out uh uh they they were they were so awesome and uh, backstage uh, parties, it was crazy. Uh, playing some of these big shows, uh, nothing like it. It was, uh, I love the sound check when you're hitting the drums and getting the, the vibration of the whole room. And um, <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so. So you guys played in Berlin. Was that, did you guys play the Monsters of Moscow? Am I? Uh, I yeah, but that was after I left the band, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Mo- Monsters of Moscow. Oh, yeah. I would I would have liked to play that show. <laughs> if uh, any guy, anybody out there wants to uh, check out my new stuff with Big News, please visit uh, bignewspdx.bandcamp.com, and uh, you can pre-order the record now. Uh, but you're you're actually gonna air this when it's probably released anyway. So we'll be sending it out to you. <laughs> Like he said, go get the album, Big News, The Lowdown. It's going to be released on Valentine's Day. Thank you so much, Ivan, for coming hey, on the show. Hey, thank you. It was very nice to meet you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely, man. And uh, maybe we'll work on something together. Right? Cool. That, yeah. I won't bug you too much. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, have a good day. I'll talk to you All later. Right. Take care, buddy. <laughs> <laughs>